all so much for, for being here today. I'm Wyatt, I'm on the venture team at Seedinvest uh, by Circle, so we're a, a platform traditionally for startups, um, doing equity crowdfunding, and now we've moved a little bit into the digital asset space, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, my lawyers made us do that. So I wanna tell a short story about um, token sales and regulators. And if you, who, who here has seen The Joker? Recent film, no? Almost. Well, this is kind of what it's been like over the past couple of years, right? 2017 happened, um, the market boomed, the market crashed. It's kind of what it looks like today, right? So we've seen that recently with a couple very large issuers that have come to market, released an asset, um, and it seems like the SEC is just cracking down on everybody, or at least they're, they're going after the largest sales. Um, but there's been some actually really amazing movements that have happened um, in the last couple of years, I would say in, in 2019, two really notable projects, Blockstack and Props. So Blockstack did the first ever qualified Reg A+. Plus. Um, we'll get into what Reg A+, plus is later, but issuing $24 million worth of tokens to about 3,500 investors, um, doing so with feedback from the SEC and a qualified offering is pretty impressive. You now did the second offering, but did it in a slightly different way. So they did, um, basically a, a distribution or ongoing uh, airdrop. Um, but there's been a couple other companies that have taken the opposite side. And I would say this is largely what the market has done to date, which is to say it's not a security um, and therefore I'm not subject to regulation by the SEC. Um, if we look at Block One, Kick, Telegram, we now know that's not the case. Uh, so, uh, you know, selling over a billion dollars worth of tokens privately does not exempt us from securities laws. So if you look at the current market landscape, as I mentioned before, token sales were an incredible vehicle for raising capital, specifically towards 2018, um, and then basically have died <laughs> since uh, coming into 2019. So. These are some fun market statistics, but if you look at the performance of I ICOs and IEOs, they're obviously one of the worst investment vehicles that we could potentially ever have. That said, um, they've proved that capital formation online is honestly an incredible vehicle, right? So we can get millions of people all over the world um, to now invest in this asset class, but there's largely no laws and there's no rules. Um, and I think this is the big thing that the SEC is looking at. They're going. Where are the risks? Where are the disclosures? Where's the information about the operating history of the company? Financial disclosures, it, it's largely non-existent. Um, and then you look at security token offerings or STOs, and that really hasn't boomed yet. So I think right now, oh, that's a bummer. I think right now, so this is, this is basically a slide to show where we're at in, in 2019. Sorry, the image doesn't show up, but, um, what we're seeing is that ICOs, IEOs, largely again, go on this trajectory where they go up and they go right back down again. We're seeing um, really large deals, but what we're really seeing is VCs, right? So VCs are running this space. A lot of the capital is going back into seed, going back into series A rounds, um, and we're actually getting into a place where, I'm sorry again that this isn't showing. Um, sorry about that. What we're seeing again is that capital is going back into private markets versus public markets, um, which means that we're probably gonna see yet another shift where these assets are gonna be launching, they're going back into the public markets again, um, but maybe this time around we'll see something that's less of the IEO, ICO trend, which has essentially been um, more, more pump and dump-ish to date, and maybe something that starts to resemble VC a little bit, maybe uh, you know, encouraging investors to hold assets for a longer period of time, um, which will, you know, maybe bring about a new market to the U.S. So this is how we're solving this problem. So a little bit about us. Um, we've been in the traditional security space for quite a long time, but both of our founders are actually pretty instrumental in lobbying with Congress to roll out what's known as the Jobs Act. Um, for those who are not familiar with the Jobs Act, it changed the securities laws dating back to 1933. Um, and rolled out a couple key initiatives. So Reg D 506C, which allows for general solicitation um, for non-accredited, or excuse me, for accredited investors, brought, start, uh, brought startup investing online. 
Reg CF, which allows you to raise up to a million dollars from uh, non-accredited investors, and Reg A Plus, which allows you to raise up to $50 million from non-accredited investors. Um, so we're the first company to offer that on our platform. Um, and to date, we have about 285,000 uh, investors, of which I would say like 50 to 60,000 are accredited. Um, good group of institutions, family offices, and funds, but largely uh, a, a really large retail investor base. Um, and most recently, we're the first uh, company in crypto to get an ATS license from FINRA. An ATS license is an uh, alternative trading system. Um, and then about a year ago, we announced we were being acquired by Circle. So the mission there was to um, take what we're doing in the traditional security space and apply that to what's going on in crypto. So use the existing securities exemptions to, as, as a framework to release digital assets. Um, and when I say digital assets, that's, that's very broadly speaking. So crypto native assets to um, you know, tokenized equity, real estate. I think we're seeing really interesting things right now. I don't know if everyone saw what uh, Spencer Dimwitty from the Brooklyn Nets is doing with uh, doing a tokenized contract. A lot of really interesting things. So we want to be at the forefront of that. Um, so what is Reggae Plus? Is anyone here familiar really with, with Reggae Plus? A little bit? Cool. So it, it's a weird thing, right? So everyone looks at Reggae Plus now, and it's um, since Blockstack used it, um, it, it's kind of been this really interesting thing where people people act like it, it just came about like two days ago. But it's been around for about four years. Um, initially, uh, or a lot of people call it the mini IPO, um, given that fees are, are a lot less than a traditional IPO. Um, there's no transfer restrictions, meaning that it's often used as a listing vehicle. Uh, but it didn't really have a home for, for many years, if, if we're being honest. A lot of people used it as a listing vehicle. Uh, penny stocks, OTC, didn't really have a place. But now in crypto, it's this one exemption that actually allows us to do a lot and doesn't actually restrict the utility of a token. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see a lot more of it. So here's some of the common misconceptions with Reg A+. And again, we have two assets in the United States that have use Reg A plus block stack in props. So um, we don't really have a lot of good benchmarks, but that said, it's been around for a while. So often we talk with issuers and the first thing that comes up is um, Reg A plus is expensive. So block stack spent about $3.5 million, I think something in that range to, to launch their asset. Um, that said, they were tip of the spear uh, going out there and actually trailblazing for the entire industry. So. Muneeb, the founder, often says that's their donation to crypto. And, and honestly, they, they gave us a wonderful playbook. But it's not that expensive. Um, most companies spend, and this is public information, about $100,000, $150,000 to get uh, Reg A Plus is qualified by the SEC. So it's, it's honestly not that expensive. Um, Reg A Plus kills the utility value of network protocols. Not true. Um, in fact, you can use a token as you choose through Reg A+, plus, um, often companies issue, or, or in the case of Blockstack, for example, have a vesting schedule. So there are some restrictions in terms of uh, how those tokens are being rolled out into the market, but there's no restrictions in how you use that within the network protocol. Um, Reg A+, plus is really time consuming. It took about a year and a half for Blockstack to get qualified. The average time for a company to get qualified through Reg A+, plus is about four months. Um, We've done about 20 Reg A pluses, and I think our average time to market is slightly below that, around three, three and a half months. Um, this is a big one. Companies hate reporting. Um, I don't blame them, but the reporting requirements of Reg A plus, uh, people often cite as a reason to not utilizing Reg A plus. Uh, however, if you use uh, a, something like a trust company to have one shareholder of record, you can actually eliminate reporting after one year. Um, I think companies like Blockstack are going to choose to report again and again because they like the transparency of that. But this is something that I think issuers really get bugged by. Um, another thing is you see people keep going, well, I can do a Reg D or a Reg S sale, right? Reg S is just a safe harbor where you have to block out the U.S. Um, and people think that you can't have uh, foreign investors participate through Reg A+, plus, but you actually can. So it often makes no sense to do a Reg, a, a reg S on top of a Reg A+. Plus. I'd rather just do a Reg A+. Plus. Um, this is the big one. If I do a Reg A+, plus, does that mean my token is a security forever? Um, we don't know. 
but I think with a lot of these assets, they probably do look like securities. Um, but surely, if you can have a conversation with regulators, like a company like Blockstack will, if you're actually building something that will someday become a network that is sufficiently decentralized, um, and you can have a conversation with regulators, you'll probably be some of the first assets that will transfer um, from the jurisdiction of the SEC to the CFTC. Um, and I would say the second one to that would be, people think regulators right now are going after projects, that the door is closed, that there's absolutely um, no way that they're gonna wanna have a conversation, but um, we're, a, we're a broker dealer regulated by FINRA, and, and I think that the conversations we've had with regulators are actually the exact opposite. Um, they want companies to come in the front door. Uh, they want to have these conversations. They want to understand what these issuers are, are attempting to do. Um, but the problem is no one's, no one's going to them right now, right? We've had two projects to date that have actually tried to do this uh, the right way in the United States. So the approach they're taking is if you go around us, we'll come after you. If not, we'll absolutely have these conversations. So a little bit about us. Um, again, we're a licensed broker dealer, so a lot of our offerings uh, tend to go around the public side of things. So Reg D, 506C, Reg A+. Um, we have partners that we work with on the Reg S side. Um, from an SEC perspective, we're one of the most frequent filers for Form Cs and, and Form 1As. Uh, so that's Reg CF and Reg A plus offerings. Um, Given that we, we have a platform uh, that caters to all investors, we try to keep things as broad as possible. We want retail investors to have the exact same opportunities of, uh, of accredited investors. Um, and this is interesting, but you often see a lot of platforms that don't offer things that we think are just table stakes, like KYC, AML, accreditation, suitability checks. Um, it's not a product for us. It's something that we offer as a service. Uh, most regulated companies in the United States. That's, again, just table stakes. Um, something we also use are, are regulated escrow agents. So making sure that we provide a fiduciary responsibility to investors and that the money isn't just flowing uh, to an account directly to a company, but using escrow agents provides that buffer to ensure that, for example, if companies need a certain amount of runway, um, we're not just blindly sending money to a company, but we're doing contingency offerings to ensure that they have enough cash. I'm sorry, but this is, oh, here we go. Another Joker meme. Um, so we're really big on regulated offerings coming to market in 2020. Um, we think that Reg A plus, Reg D provides like a really amazing framework to do that. Um, and it's something that we're gonna be doubling down on. So I'd be happy to answer any questions um, or kind of open the floor for any discussion um, around anything we just talked about. Yes. Sure. So is there a way to differentiate When you say traditional, do you mean like a like IPO or um, so or like a ICO? Yep. Cool. Yep. Sure. Sure, so um, if we're doing a Reg CF or Reg D offering, we actually don't charge companies anything up front. Um, so we actually bear the risk. Uh, if they're successful, we charge them a success-based fee. If they're unsuccessful, we eat the cost. Um, so I would say those offerings tend to be under $5 million offerings, uh, traditionally. So the, the costs associated with that are a 7.5% cash fee and a 5% equity fee. That's based on what we raise on the platform. So, for example, if you raise a million dollars, we're gonna wire you $925,000 from escrow at closing. Uh, we'll take 75K for our services, and $50,000 uh, would be our equity fee. So that would be against the post-money valuation, or if you're taking with a, with a token, it would be like network value. Um, with Reg A+, our setup costs are traditionally between like 150 to $250,000, um, we break that into three tranches. So companies often pay maybe $30,000, $40,000 up front. Um, and then we take a success-based fee. So 
traditionally, I think for, for token offerings, that tends to be about like 5% flat rate fee. Um, given we're a broker dealer, we can charge success based fees. So all of our offerings are generally contingency offerings and, and have that kind of rate. Um, but that's, you know, even from the, the Reg A plus side, that's a really important thing to highlight because again, people are hiring the best lawyers in the world, which is great, but Reg A plus is, you know, largely a, a templated offering at this point, in my opinion. So charging a million dollars, $1.5 million is, is absurd. So I think the costs around these uh, services will continue to collapse. So even our 150,000, I hope that we can continue driving that down. Um, the most expensive thing is actually the audit. And I think that's the tough thing with, with crypto companies right now. Um, it depends on how you're handling whatever crypto you're holding. Um, often the structures of the companies are, are sometimes quite elaborate, right? So you might have like a Swiss or a, or a company based out of Malta, parent company, sub in the US, sub in Europe, moving money around via those wallets. Like that can be hard to audit. So that's why I think that the cost or, or the timeframes with a lot of these things take a little bit longer. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Where's the liquidity after the A plus? It can't be traded right now in the United States, right? Because it's going up against the digital lines. So it's going to provide a place for liquidity for market makers and institutions. Yeah, so we do have an ATS license, but you're absolutely correct. Um, not many people, so I think us and Coinbase have an ATS license, um, but there is no public market right now um, for private securities, or there is no. ATS that's operating in the in the digital token space. So I'd say there is no liquidity. Um, I think the approach that a lot of these companies have taken is, let's do, a, for example, again, if we look at Blockstack, it's basically like a two year investing schedule. And I'd argue that they're probably playing the market a little bit to assume that in two years there will be a couple ATSs out there. But the truth is we need more assets. Um, I think there's like seven or eight, you know, security tokens, if you will. Uh, probably two of those are crypto native assets. So we just don't have enough right now to launch a product around that. But I think it will come. I think the first step is let's get the primary issuance done. Um, and then let's roll out a secondary exchange on top of that. Um, and, and who knows, we could see people like Binance, et cetera, entering the space. Um, the problem is you need to get things like a broker dealer license. So that's the first step. But Harbor, for example, just got one, now a transfer agent. Uh, I would say it's inevitable. I'm sure they'll do something in the security space and for a secondary market. So the truth is you need a lot of exchanges, you need market makers, you need primary insurance platforms, you need more assets. So uh, hopefully the SEC will help in, in kind of ensuring that this process uh, becomes a lot smoother. Yes. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so that's, that's for um, the audit and Form 1A, basically. So using outside counsel to build the Form 1A and using an outside uh, CPA to do the full audit. <laughs> No, but I, I think, I mean, it's, it's possible. I think you'd still probably have to use an ATS to actually begin to trade. If you, I, I don't think a, a company is going to be able to facilitate that. Um, block stack, GSR. Yeah, so that, that's for the reg S side of the offering. So a lot of the movement you're seeing on that um, is actually so they bifurcated the two offerings, which you have to do. Uh, so, you know, I think they raised something like, 14 million through the Reg A plus and about 10 million through the Reg S. The Reg S is now tradable on Binance, but it's a little misleading because no US investors can access that type of liquidity. So it's really uh, stemming from uh, Binance themselves as well as uh, Hashkey Capital and a couple of the other investors that came in through that offering. Um, so yeah, it's again, restricted from US traders. So US, we just have to hold right now. but. I also don't think that's such a bad thing, right? So like if you're, if you have a venture investment, you don't try to, you know, get out of that position within what they closed the offering maybe 30 days ago, 60 days ago, like 
getting out of the position in two months just because the market's going to move. Um, I think what they're trying to incentivize is to actually have people hold these assets and, and actually use them within the block stack platform. So um, I think that's a good thing. But I'm not sure that we need instant liquidity here in the U.S. just yet. I think we need more assets. And honestly, the, most people in the U.S. are not buying these assets, and we've been largely restricted from doing so. This is the first time that we actually have access to buying into this asset class in a, in a regulated manner. Yep. Uh, did you uh, say that you have, if someone lists with a reg to take bucks in your account, yep. or lists with bucks in your account, are you providing the sales model there as well? Like, you already have a list of, you said 75,000 investors or something like that. Do they get exposed to this asset? Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, so the, the compliance side of things is, um, a service that we provide just because we think we can do it faster, cheaper, and, and better than hiring an outside law firm. And we've, again, created like more of a templated program. I would say the real uh, service we provide is around the marketing um, and the sales side. So uh, most people at our company are actually employed on that side of the business. So yeah, I mean, we, we, wanna, we wanna manage everything across the entire sale um, so that really what you're focusing on is leveraging your community um, and leveraging our community to to sell, um, to sell your own asset or to do a, an equity sale. Um, so you're not focused on things like, for example, paying your lawyers a, a ton of money. Um, It depends. So, you know, if you did a, a, a Reg D private token sale, um, within a year period, you have to respect that lockup period. So that's called Rule 144A. Meaning they can't sell anything. Yeah, meaning they can't sell separately. If you, again, observed Reg S, the, the safe harbor associated with that, um, there's a year long period in which that can't flow back to the US. So you, you need to ensure whatever partners you're working with, um, or, you know, if it's coded into your smart contract, whatever it may be. You need to be really careful of that. Is there a plus? Is there such a thing as a quiet period when you file an SEO lawsuit? Yeah, so. How do you market then? How do you market the securities to your investors? So, actually, a, a lot of the work is done during what's known as testing the waters. So, traditionally, testing the waters is a, a period where you can go out and kind of gauge market interest. Um, what I think Blockstack did in the way that we've always approached it is. It's actually a wonderful period to take indications of interest. You have a lot more flexibility in what you can market. You can go out into the media, podcasts, things that you can't do really when you're doing a public sale because everything needs to be one click away via link, for example. Um, so testing the waters is really when we go out and begin marketing it to not only our customers, but uh, the general public. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting time. So that, that's kind of around what's known as a public flip. Right, so I think what you're referring to is that there's a private time in which you're going through comments with the SEC. Um, when we get to a, a low amount of comments where we feel like we're eventually going to get qualified, we do what's called a public flip. So maybe we have five comments left. Publicly flip, everyone can see what those comments are. Um, they can see the entire 41A offering. Uh, the SEC might have more commentary back and forth, but we think within the next 30 to 60 days, uh, we're gonna actually launch that. So during that period we do reservations, indications of interest, things like that, um, and really leverage that period. Public flip is when, um, so for example, what I'm talking about with the qualification period is, you build a Form 1A, you go to the SEC and you file it. They come back and they go, we need more information on this. We think that, you know, we don't really understand, like, what does this mean, decentralized? Like, elaborate, right? right? Not a no comment letter, actually. It's, they, they directly comment on lines within the Form 1A. So um, I would say like a, a large amount of comments would be something like 30. A small amount of comments might be five, so it might be related to uh, risks and disclosures, comments in the audit. A public flip is when, so you go through this privately. If you want, you can make it public, but most companies go through it privately. Um, and then at a period when they feel like there's a low amount of comments, they was called a public flip where they publicly show what's going on so that it can get into testing the waters, which, which would be just like letting investors know, hey, I have this offering, here's the offering circular, it's not qualified yet, but we're going through comments with the SEC right now so the public can actually read that. 
Yeah. Yes. Yes, you can limit it to accredited investors. Um, it's something we often do, Reg D 506C. Um, I think with token sales, I would say most, most issuers probably want to do something which, which includes not accredited investors, because again, if you're, you know, if you're building an ecosystem, um, developers, for example, um, you're, you're limiting it to very few people. I think like 2% of the population qualifies as accredited in the US. Um, so I, I would say, the trajectory that you see is a lot of private sales, which traditionally are VCs, accredited investors, so private sale, private sale, private sale, and then public sale, and then maybe may net launch. Um, so I think, yeah, we'll, we'll absolutely do, uh, call it private or, or even public to accredited investor sales, but I think largely the market will probably focus on, on Reg A+. Um, in terms of running the actual sale, so traditionally companies raise on our platform for about 45 days. So you know maybe 30 days set up call or set, set up time, and then uh, a 45 day raise. Hard to tell with some of these assets that are coming out. Um, I think if you look at the market, Blockstack raised for about 60 days. Uh, companies on Binance raised in six seconds. So let's see. I think again the U.S. has been largely cut out of this. Um, so I think we'll see in the next year what the market appetite will be. Oh, good. Is there a minimum uh, amount of uh, requirement or a minimum amount of, uh, uh, what, is, what is the minimum amount needed to even start thinking about this process? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the, the minimum amount would be um, on, the, on the issuer side, so on, on the company side, um, having a product, um, having a team, I think we've moved on from the days of just having a white paper and an idea, right? Um, even in the IEO market, which I think largely has boomed and, and, and absolutely dropped. So I think it's starting to look more like a like financing for for a traditional startup. So do you have a team? Do you have a business plan? Do you are you actually executing on that? Um, I think that this the, the public markets are actually like pretty realistic, um, and I think that valuations even, for example, are, are a big deal now. So I, I think long gone are the days where we can raise, you know, 50, 100 million on an idea with, with nothing, no team, just an absurd valuation, just for pure speculative reasons. Um, so say on the minimum, you, you need to be actually out there building something and something that people actually need that there's real value to. Um, and then from there, I mean, again, the costs associated with doing a lot of these things, like we absorb a lot of them. Um, we want to make sure that there's low risk for companies that we work with. Um, that said, we, you know, we've had about 75,000 applications to date and we've accepted less than 1%. So part of what we're doing is vetting these companies and actually working with them to structure the offerings. So what we're offering our investors in turn are really great companies. Um, so you know, in some ways we're not the best fit for everyone. There are other platforms or accelerators that I think can do a really good job of helping these companies get to market and then we're probably a better fit when there is that traction. Um, again, maybe that's revenue or partnerships or customers or something like that. Yes. To issue what? Yeah, so um, what's been largely used today, it's a good question, right? Because like, is it a security? Yes. Um, is it a token? Yes. What people have done is using what's known as like an investment contract. Um, so it's not equity, it's a contract for future tokens. Um, I think that's the best way to think about it. And it, it is a really odd framework, um, just because you're, you're kind of finding loopholes here to make tokens make sense. Um, but I think you can think of them even in the investment contract, uh, realm that it's, it's basically equity in a network, right? So uh, there's a lot of things that you need to look at. Um, in that, so token economics, dilution, um, even inflation. So understanding how you're going to be potentially diluted over time is a, is a really important thing. Maybe, maybe the most question back to this: Is this like a dollar-based thing, or is this like a ERC-20 token? Depends on the issuer, right? So there are crypto-native assets that are going to be 
uh, coming out there will be issuing their own tokens on uh, you know their own blockchains. Um, there's a long tail of assets that are coming out from Definity, Solana, Polkadot, right? So they're going to be doing uh, their own their own blockchains. That's likely not going to be ERC20. That said, market share, Ethereum has about 88% market share of, of ICOs today. So most of them have been ERC20s. I think for tokenized securities, um, companies that are issuing equity or, or tokenizing existing securities, you'll likely see an ERC20 token. Um, it's just the easiest to do. It's the easiest thing to wrap and then use like transfer agents like Securitize, for example, to, to manage that process. Um, will it be equity though? It depends. Um, I don't think blockchain networks traditionally have taken the equity approach. They're taking like, for example, Blockstack is a R&D investment contract. So you're basically stating I'm funding this network so they can actually build it. You don't have equity in Blockstack. Um, you actually have tokens in a sub of the parent company of Blockstack. So again, no claim on assets. Technically, you don't get any information to the parent company. Um, they're just being incredibly transparent, so they're releasing a lot of information around the uh, financial stability of the parent company. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, yeah, it's a great question. This is something that we're working on right now with, um, with FINRA and with regulators to offer, um, yeah, ma a top market cap crypto as a payment method. Um, we also happen to have a joint venture with Coinbase um, around USDC. So it's the top market cap stable coin. Um, that's something we're also working on right now. Um, and again, a, a lot of this is like what issuers want. So some companies only want to receive um, investment in Bitcoin, for example. Some companies don't want any market volatility and they just want USDC or cash. So for us, we've traditionally operated in the ACH wire, um, you know, direct bank account type funding, but we're going to be rolling out on our platform for crypto offerings, Bitcoin, Ether, and USDC. So that's what we're working on right now. Yeah. No, so uh, like the investment contract would be just basically like the Form 1A. Um, I, I think tokenized contracts are really interesting. There's companies like Open Law that are doing really fantastic stuff around that. Um, this is just you're signing a contract um, based on the Form 1A. The investment contract is just kind of a way around calling it equity. So you have equity, debt, investment contract is understanding that this isn't quite equity. This is buying a, you know, a, a token. Um, so to not call it equity, what's the closest thing we can call it? An investment contract and kind of supporting the funding of a network. So that's why it's largely been like an R&D contract. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I'd be happy to um, stick around and, uh, and chat with anybody if anyone has any questions um, about the platform, about the process. Um, thank you so much for, for having me here today. Appreciate it.